So we're continuing our study tonight on uh, what it means to be an heir of the kingdom. That's really what the Beatitudes are. They're declarations of the king. And tonight we're kind of focusing on one that's the kind of a hinge in the Beatitudes. Uh, the Beatitudes aren't usually, or they are usually, but they shouldn't be think, thought of as, you know, just acute uh, sayings that are nice that you sew on a pillow at grandma's house. And, and uh, they don't have any real meaning that goes past that. But the Beatitudes aren't, weren't just random sayings uh, of Jesus that aren't connected. They they're chained that build on one another, that you can see the connection of them if you uh, look at them and just really think of, about them and study them uh, in connection with each other. And so the first three have kind of been about self-examination. Uh, we've seen poorness in spirit in relation to the richness of who God is. We've seen mourning in relation t- uh, to the holiness of God and seeing our sinfulness. We've seen ourselves... Uh, needing a change of will to even will the right things in meekness to uh, have the right desires and a change of will to the will of God that's his power and his sovereignty and tonight we see uh, the beauty or the righteousness of God and the hinge is we change from looking inward at ourselves to outward at God and we desire the righteousness of God and so our passage tonight is uh, Matthew 5 6 Uh, in the the fourth in the list of the Beatitudes, and Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor... uh, Starting over. Blessed are the hunger... uh, One more time. (laughs) We'll keep it going until I get it right. (laughs) Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And so the question uh, that we can kind of base the night around and that we can each face is what do you hunger and thirst for? Everyone is hungering and thirsting for something. There's no one here who just doesn't have any hunger whatsoever, but what is it that you're hungering for? And we have four points here on the board of what uh, what Jesus was talking about and what spiritual hunger looks like. So point number one is the blessing. And we mentioned this multiple times, the blessing. We've mentioned uh, what this means multiple times, and I'm going to mention what it means again. Be- and the reason why we do that is, why, why don't you guys just mention, you know, blessed once at the beginning uh, and explain what it means, and then you don't have to do it again. Well, the reason why we don't do that, and, the re- and this is a good rule for Bible study, is because Jesus didn't just say blessed once. He said it nine times in a row. He didn't just say blessed are all these and then named off a list. He actually said Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the, uh, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, and so on. So if some, Jesus is saying something nine times in a row, over and over again, it's something that we should pay attention to. And what Jesus is doing here is, uh, which wouldn't be obvious to us, we're, not, we're Americans in the 21st century, not Jews in the 1st century, is what Jesus is doing here is he's speaking as a prophet, and this would have been recognizable to the prophets, and not to the prophets, to the people. And what Jesus does is he's speaking in what they would have known as an oracle, which the prophets spoke about in the Old Testament. And there were two types of oracle, or oracular way of speaking. The two types were oracles of weal, W-E-A-L, or were oracles of woe. And so basically, that's not that complicated. What it really means is there were prophecies that were good news, and there were prophecies that were bad news. And Jesus actually uses both. In Matthew 23, he went to the uh, Pharisees and gave the eight woes. Woe to you, Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you who do this and that. And he said that eight times. So he used that. And that's what the prophets of the Old Testament did for a prophecy that was of judgment. But a prophecy that was of good news, of God's blessing, started with the word blessed. So when Jesus is speaking blessed, he's speaking as a prophet to the people. And just draw your attention back to a passage uh, that Danny brought up from the Old Testament that kind of defines what the blessing would mean uh, for the Old Test for the Jews uh, who knew the Old Testament, Numbers six twenty four through twenty six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. 
So the blessing of God involves his face shining on someone, his countenance being favorable to that person, meaning he gives a favorable look to the person, he gives them grace, he gives them peace. So it's basically spiritual well-being. And so that's what Jesus is saying whenever he says blessed, so you can keep that in mind. But what is he blessing here in particular? He's blessing those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness. He's blessing a spiritual desire. And so that's point number two, is the desire. Now these two, there's two aspects of what he blesses here, the desire for righteousness. There's the desire for saving righteousness, and there's the desire for sanctifying righteousness. And these two are parallel. They run together all the way to heaven. You don't have one without the other. And... Uh, But they have a different aspect to them. What Jesus is more focused on here is the sanctification aspect, but that can't come without the new birth in the salvation aspect. Uh, So in the Old Testament, if we want to focus on salvation for just a minute, in the Old Testament, when God spoke about righteousness, salvation and righteousness were words that were used in the same way. They were synonyms. And words that we can kind of think of uh, when we think about righteousness which has to do with saving and sanctifying righteousness, is we need to think about righteousness in the terms of it is foreign or it's alien, meaning it's outside of ourselves. It's not something that we look within and, oh, it was there the whole time and I just didn't know. It's something that we have to look outside for. We can't get it here. We can't get it from anyone but God. And another aspect of the saving righteousness and how it's connected to uh, to growing righteousness in us is that salvation, which is defined as being covered in the righteousness of God, doesn't make someone less aware of sin. It makes someone more aware of sin. Uh, And it causes that person to desire Christ. It's really dumb to think that someone can have the perfect righteousness of God in Christ over them and then ignore their sin because they see themselves in comparison to who Christ is. So the realization of sinfulness is part of that salvation, part of that new birth that comes, and that causes desire to run to Christ. So we see the desire for that righteousness. And all of the Beatitudes have a common theme in them. The common theme running through them is an intense desire to be free from self in all aspects, and our self connected with our sin because everything we do is selfish, sinful, And it's a desire to get away from us and to look to outside after seeing the reality about ourselves. Uh, We have no righteousness on our own. We have nothing right in us that is naturally right with God. We can't find it in ourselves. We can't produce it. We can't go seek it and grab it from somewhere uh, that's naturally available to us. The only thing we invite from God is condemnation, naturally. But, savingly, God offers us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Meaning in Christ, God can look at us and see us as a judge, can see us as judicially righteous or right before him, that he declares us to be righteous in his eyes. So someone can come and have the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. <clears throat> and Jesus is our only righteousness before God. And so, in Christ, are you can turning down the air a little bit? Yeah, turning down the heat. Yeah, it's hot. It was, it was like 51 when I came in here, no, now it's like 85. Degrees, so it's like <laughs> but anyway, back to what I was saying. So Jesus is our only righteousness. We can't derive any righteousness from the law, meaning we can't put our suckers onto the law and suck out any righteousness in it because the law is not made for that purpose. The law is only made to show us our need for Christ, our need for, for true righteousness that we don't have. And we need the righteousness of Christ to cover us. Uh, but the person who can identify with the beatitude, someone who realizes they have nothing, they're poor in spirit, are sad over that fact, sad over their sin. That They realize they don't even have the will to change. They need God's will to rule them. The person who sees that about themselves is the person who's ready for the, to stop hungering and thirsting for all the things of this world, stop hungering and thirsting for the things of the flesh and sin, and they're ready to hunger and thirst for Christ. And that's where the connection is. That's whether you're saved or not. That's something that, uh, that we all need to realize, that we're ready to hunger and thirst for something better once we realize the, what the Bible says about us. But there's something even more than that, that Christ 
didn't just preach a message, Christ actually preached himself. He preached himself and people to come to him for righteousness. And think about the concept that's so easy to understand of hunger and thirst. Uh, Jesus fed 5,000 people, then left for a day. They tried to make him king by force, so he left. And then he came back and the people were still in the crowd and they're like, Oh, oh Christ, when did you get here? And they said, they were trying to argue with him into, hey, give us more of that bread. Make us more, uh, feed us for the rest of our lives so we don't have to worry about seeking food ever again. The kind of social gospel aspect that that Jesus just goes out into the world and just does good and didn't really have a message to preach or a mission. And Jesus is saying, look, you need the, he goes, you need to not seek temporal bread. You need to not seek physical bread. You need to seek eternal food. And he's trying to point out himself. And the Jews say, no, not really. I, I, don't, I don't want that right now. What they say in John 6, 28 is, why don't you teach us how to do the works of God? And meaning teach us how to create bread out of nothing and, and be able to feed ourselves without uh, working for food. And he says, the work of God is to believe in him who he sent. And they're like, well, what about Moses? He gave us manna out of heaven. And Jesus is like, no, God gave you manna out of heaven. God rained physical bread on people and kept them alive. They were kept alive by the word of the Father. But the Father sent down something better. He sent down eternal bread that you can eat and live forever. And the people are like, oh, Lord, give us this bread. And Jesus looks them in the face and says in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet did not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Meaning they were seeking, like a lot of people do today, they were seeking all the nice things around Jesus, that Jesus could create bread and feed people, and they were seeking and enjoying those things, but didn't want Jesus himself. And people are at a risk of that. Us in this room are at a risk of that, of seeking all the niceness around Jesus and and ignoring Jesus completely. He is the food we need to hunger for. And Jesus even stood up on the last day of a feast, stood up and yelled to the people, John 7, 37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And Jesus had to be God or else he would have... You would have said, go to God. But he said, come to me if anyone thirsts, and you'll never thirst again. But God creates this hunger in people so that he can fill it. Uh, A.W. Pink, the writer of that book, Attributes in God, that we read through before, says, when God creates a hunger and a thirst in the soul, it is so that he may satisfy it. When the poor sinner is made to feel his need of Christ, it is that he may be drawn and led to embrace him. Meaning God creates the hunger so that God can be the one to fill the hunger and so that we know that it is the work of God alone. I want you to also think about this, that Jesus is our savior in this, but he's also our example. Jesus is the only one who's truly hungered and thirsted for righteousness as a man. He hungered and thirsted to demonstrate and Uh, justify the righteousness of God. It was his meat and drink to do the will of him who sent him. And eventually we will be in heaven with God where we will hunger and thirst physically no more. And we'll just hunger and thirst for Jesus. And that will be, that will be it. That's what, and we'll be constantly satisfied in that. But a song that, that kind of uh, really sums this up. It's a song that we sing often. It has a lot of just great lines in it, but one, uh, come you sinners, Uh, that we sing a lot, says, Not the righteous, sinners Jesus came to call. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. Meaning, don't think, okay, well, I can can kind of make it up. In summer school, all the fitness he requires, what does Jesus require that you come to him? Is that you feel your need of him, and even this he gives you. Meaning, Jesus creates the need, and he also fulfills the need. But this righteousness, uh, the desire for righteousness in this context includes being covered in the righteousness of Christ officially before God, that God sees us as righteous as Christ in his eyes if we know Christ by faith. But it goes past that. It goes beyond that. 
the desire to be right with God, which is what righteousness means, is beyond just having the stamp of God's approval on our lives. We don't end there. We continue in that, and we grow deeper in understanding that, but it goes beyond that. And the righteousness, how we're going to define it tonight, is the desire to be righteous and free from sin in every area. To be positively holy, meaning on the positive side, and negatively to be free from every aspect of sin in our lives. Thought, word, and deed. And so this is more than a superficial rightness, uh, righteousness, and a desire to be free from the consequences of sin. Uh, there's a lot of reasons not to sin, but this is a desire to be o- get away from sin in all aspects. This means a desire to be free from the very desire for sin, a desire for new desires, and a desire from the pollution of sin. Everyone uh, desires blessing. Okay, everyone's like, everyone likes to read the Beatitudes, whether they're Christian or not, and they're like, blessing. Oh, okay, well, I want that. When we re- what we really should be looking at is righteousness. That's what we should desire, whether there's a blessing or not. Everyone desires well-being. Everyone wants to go to heaven. You're not necessarily special or necessarily even spiritually healthy if you just desire heaven and blessing, because... Everyone desires heaven and blessing. They just don't want God to be there when they get there, and they don't want their blessing to come from God. They want to create it themselves. But unrighteous people who do not hunger for righteousness still want to go to heaven, still want to be blessed, uh, still want to have good things in their lives, but they don't want new hearts. They don't want a new nature. Uh, The Puritan Thomas Watson said, The hypocrite does not desire grace for itself. He desires grace only as a bridge to lead him over to heaven. He does not so much desire after grace as glory. He does not so much desire the way of righteousness as the crown of righteousness. His desire is not to be made like Christ, but to reign with Christ. Such desires as these are found among the damned. Meaning, people in hell had these desires. This is the hypocrite's hunger. But the child of God desires grace for itself and Christ for himself. To a believer, not only is heaven precious, but Christ is precious. Meaning that we don't desire Christ just because he gets us into heaven and gets us out of hell. We desire him. He he includes that and thank God for that. But I would submit that the desire here is so strong that even if heaven was not the end of it, that the, this desire, this new nature, would desire righteousness anyway, even if there was no reward for it, which God graciously grants one. Uh, but a lot of people are like, yes, righteousness. There should be rightness in the world and justice and fairness and all that, and all that's fine in its own way. But that's not the righteousness Jesus is talking about. And so we have to define it by the Sermon on the Mount, by the other scriptures that Jesus uh, spoke. And one way to do that is that it's, superior righteousness. It's above and beyond any human righteousness. This righteousness is not the best that a non-saved person can have. It's not like the nicest, most friendly, unsaved person. It's that only a believer can have this righteousness. It's a reality of righteousness in the heart. And the verse around which the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is based, which we haven't gotten to yet, is when Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Meaning it's a surpassing righteousness. Jesus looked at the most righteous, so-called righteous, religious elite people in his society, in his world, and says, unless your righteousness is better than that, unless it's better than what they have, you're not entering the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't belong to you. That would be like, and this isn't actually true, but imagine me coming in here and saying, thinking of some of the men you, uh, you and I look up to as spiritual leaders and saying, unless your righteousness is better than them, unless your righteousness has something that theirs doesn't have, then you're not entering the kingdom. Like, imagine how shocking that would have been, and that's what Jesus said. But another way he also defined it is uh, later in Matthew 6, in the first verse, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness 
before men in order to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Meaning it's not a righteousness that's seeking recognition. It's, not, it's a righteousness that is seeking God himself, whether there's anyone around or not, and, and often seeks God in secret. It's a righteousness that also, also starts to see through our own fake righteousness. That we're able to look at ourselves and say, you know what, I really wasn't doing that for the right reasons. I really was seeking myself. I really was seeking recognition. I really wasn't seeking the Father in doing that, that public display of righteousness, PDR. But it's also a perfect righteousness. Uh, the righteousness that believers hunger for and those in the kingdom of God hunger for is a righteousness that goes along with the character of God himself. God is infinite. God is holy. God is penetrating. God is everywhere. God is pure. God is true. God is thorough. And since God's righteousness is that way, it is in line with the character of God himself. And Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, 48, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we hunger and thirst for something that we can never fully digest. Now this would be like trying to fit all the oceans of the world into a thimble. Now, you're never going to get it all in. It's like trying to ask Jesus into your heart. But it's like you're never going to get it all in. But at the same time, that's a good thing because all the infiniteness, and it's even more than this, of all the oceans is constantly going to fill that thimble over and over and over again, and the thimble would never be empty. And so we have all the infiniteness of God's righteousness available to us to participate in and enjoy. So we're continually filled, continually satisfied in all the infiniteness of God's righteousness. But it's also a righteousness that, uh, a perfect righteousness also means that it's pervasive. There's not an area of your life that it ignores. It's, it touches every area of your life inside and out. Uh, what one of my favorite Puritans, John Owen, said is that, it's, uh, that we need to desire a universal obedience. That doesn't mean a, 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 an obedience all over the universe. It means in us individually... Sometimes we desire to just stop doing a certain sin because it makes us feel bad, it makes us feel guilty, it makes us, it has consequences, uh, it invites God's judgment, it stops us from being focused. We, we want to stop doing that sin, but if God allowed us to stop doing that sin, in a sense, if he, if he didn't, didn't relieve us, if he relieved us of that sin, we just go and ignore God because that was the only thing keeping us clinging to him. And we also focus on just one area of big sin in our lives instead of all the areas of sin, every aspect of our heart and life. And so it's a perfect righteousness that gets to all of that. And that's something that we should really desire. Because if we just offered all our best righteousness to God, his stamp on it, on our own, would be filthy rags. That's what Isaiah said. That our righteousness is filthy rags. But we're so far away from righteousness... But that shouldn't stop us from hungering and, and for seeking it, because we can be satisfied with it and enjoy it. And I want you to think about this, that a righteousness that is less than perfect is not worth desiring, and it's not true righteousness. And then it's also unconditional righteousness. It doesn't have a bunch of reasons why it can't be righteous. Uh, it doesn't have a bunch of conditions that have to be in place for it to happen. The righteousness that Jesus speaks about, it's not theoretical righteousness that can only survive in the most pampered conditions, only under the right circumstances. It's a real and resilient and enduring thing that lasts. And it's something that will endure to gain if you're a believer. No matter how costly it is to gain righteousness, the desire will be stronger. And in just a few sentences, in the, in, still in the Beatitudes, Jesus will close the Beatitudes by saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Meaning, righteousness is something that believers in the kingdom will hold on to, even amongst persecution. So it's something that we can't really ultimately be diverted from. It's something that a believer can't truly be distracted from in the ultimate sense of the whole totality of life. But it's also something to seek of first importance. It's a priority. If righteousness is not a priority in your life or my life, it means that we're not believers. Matthew 6.33, Jesus will say, but seek, let me look for it, first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Meaning we're supposed to put that above our desire for clothing, above our desire for normal food, above our desire for everything else. It's supposed to be the ordering principle of all the rest of our desires. And this righteousness is not a fake righteousness that can only exist in sterile conditions, separated from the real world. But it is a righteousness that Jesus, as we'll see in the Sermon on the Mount with the sins that he goes over in the law, it's a righteousness that's expected and empowered to endure in the real world, in a real and sinful world. So it's, not, it's something that is actually useful and actually possible. But the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus here confronts unrighteous desires in an unrighteous world with unrighteous people. And he calls people to righteousness despite all that because he gives the new birth and the new nature gives the power to actually live this life. So that's the righteousness that Christ is talking about, that we should be hungering and thirsting for. So now let's look at some attributes of hunger. What is hunger? And we could probably go through scripture and see all these aspects of what hunger looks like. And if we just sat down and thought, okay, what does it mean for us to be hungry and thirsty? (laughs) We could come up with a lot, but I came up with uh, a list of them. And these are just simple things that we could have all, all realized about it. And one is that hunger is a painful thing. <clears throat> hunger is not, and thirst are not passive. You don't just, okay, well, I'm a little hungry. We, it's not the hunger of skipping a meal that Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about is the hunger and thirst of starvation. Now, we haven't ever experienced that. No one in this room has experienced that. Uh, but we can imagine that. There, it's not like we just miss a meal and, oh, well, I'm a little hungry. It's, it's a pain that, like Esau said when he came to Jacob, he said, make me some food, I'm about to die. Uh, Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Now this verse, again, is typically one that is on the coffee cup with a deer drinking from a mountain stream, and it looks very nice, but it actually has nothing to do with that. It's actually a verse that is about pain and suffering. In fact, the whole psalm, Psalm 42 and 43, which are actually one, are about pain and suffering. And so he's talking about how he thirsts after God. And, you know, we imagine like, oh, a nice deer sipping from a peaceful stream. When in actuality, deer, and you, and I've probably seen this with dogs, is deer run up mountains and they run all over the place and they can go for a long time, but then they have to find a river or else they're going to die. Like they they need water uh, pretty immediately once they've been running after a long time. So they find a river and their sides are heaving back and forth with how hard they've been running and their mouths are drooling and they get that water and they drink until they are finished drinking. That's how thirsty they are. And maybe you've seen, like I said, with a dog, how, what that's like. And that's how the psalmist, that's how the psalmist is saying he thirsts after God. So hunger is a painful thing. A hunger also is not satisfied with anything but food. Now a hungry person is not satisfied with clothes. He's not satisfied with money. He can use money, but he can't eat it. He's not satisfied with a new car, a new house. You can't give him a nice work of art. You can't hand him a bar of gold and give it any use to him. You can't just make the tablecloth look really nice and and hope that uh, things go well. He has to eat actual food. No matter how nicely the plate is laid out, he actually has to eat the food. And some people, this is how they come to church. They look at Christ, they see Christ, they see righteousness, they see the means of grace that God has provided to help us grow in righteousness, but they never eat it. It's like looking at the menu and talking about how great this hamburger looks or something like that, and admiring the picture, but never ordering one and actually eating it. And this is something that we need to think about. There's so much garnish, if you want to think about it that way, around the church, and this church is susceptible to it, which is something we need to be aware of. There's a lot of stuff that's not actually, that's not bad in itself, but it's not actually feeding people. And we need to look at what it is. It's like, it doesn't matter how many nice, so to speak, tablecloths there are, not the real tablecloths, but it doesn't matter how much 
stuff there is, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Meaning if the people aren't being fed, then the church isn't present there. And so we need to think about what are people coming to be fed with and what are we feeding them? Psalm 73, 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? Speaking to God. And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Meaning the psalmist says, heaven isn't heaven unless God is there. And on earth, I desire nothing besides God. God should be our only true desire. Meaning we have a desire subordinate to him, but he should be the true desire. And the ordering principles of all our other desires. And part of a lack of spiritual hunger is eating things that aren't real food. And this can involve sin. We try to eat and drink things that aren't water, that aren't food, that aren't good to eat and drink, or we eat, or we eat a bunch of junk food. <clears throat> Isaiah 55.2 says, Why do you spend your money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. The person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness says, Give me Christ or I will die. If someone is full of their own righteousness, if someone is full of something else, then they cannot possibly hunger for the righteousness of God. They have their own righteousness, they've built their own, they think they are in need of nothing, but really, they're as hungry as they can be, but it's like when your stomach is full of air and you don't feel like e eating anything, when in actuality, your stomach's filled with nothing. That's what it's like to have other things in us that don't actually satisfy. But also, think of distractions. Think of uh, what we undo in the work of God with 30 minutes of TV sometimes, and that's one that, it, that we all probably struggle with. I know I do. Or just things that are unnecessary, not necessarily bad in themselves, but I think we make excuses for them because they're not bad in themselves, that we don't discipline ourselves. But imagine eating a steady diet of those, you know, those little peeps that you have around, <laughs> those gross marshmallow things. Imagine eating those every day, every meal, all the time, and that's all you ate. That's what it's like when we don't eat real food. It's when it's like when we don't go to uh, the food that God's actually provided. Hunger, another one is, hunger wrestles with difficulties for food. Psalm 63, 1. O God, you are my God, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Imagine you're stuck in the desert and there's no water and you're going to die if you don't drink something. You have two options. You can sit there and die or try to seek water and possibly get out of there. You can, one, you have a better chance of actually getting water, but the other one is like, well, I'm just, it's no point. But hunger and thirst seeks food and drink without being asked. You don't have to ask a hungry person to be hungry and to go after food. They just will. We can't make ourselves righteous. We can't even create the hunger in ourselves. But we can put ourselves in the position where we're most likely to get righteousness because we know we need it. You know, there was a blind man who Jesus healed, but he didn't just lay around all day and hope that maybe Jesus would come and find him. He, tried, he found out where Jesus was going to be, and he made his way over there somehow and put himself in the way of Jesus and called out to him. He couldn't make himself see, but he laid himself down in Jesus' way so that he could get what he wanted, and Jesus was able to heal him. Charles Spurgeon said, It is natural to men who need bread to hunger. You do not have to tell them when to hunger and thirst. If they have not bread and water, they hunger and thirst naturally. <laughs> so when the Spirit of God has changed our nature, the new nature hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Unfortunately, you know, I think a lot of us feel like we wish we were more hungry ourselves, but we also wish we could hunger for other people. You, it feels like you have to tell a lot of people to be hungry when, when it should just be there. But food is something we 
continually seek and we continually <laughs> look for. Because the only other option is starvation. This is also true with spiritual hunger and thirst. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness don't just give up after difficulty. Like, well, I, if I get it, I get it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, fight against anything to get it. It's, it's just there. It, we wouldn't do that with food. It, this is also true with involvement in ministry, with pursuing holiness, with mortifying sin. H- hunger doesn't make excuses. Uh, Thomas Watson says, if men lose a meal or two, they think themselves half undone, meaning they're like, I'm dying. But they can stay away from the ordinances, which are the conduits of grace. Meaning, there are people that are like, oh yeah, I just couldn't make it to church this month. Well, it's like, I know you ate this month. Well, why didn't you get to church for spiritual, to satisfy your spiritual hunger? Because you must be dying if you hadn't eaten for a month. But the hunger's not there, and it's because they're not believers. And Jesus told a parable about the kingdom of this man, this king, who invent, invited a bunch of people to a dinner and a bunch of his friends, and they all began to make excuses. Well, I've got this going on, and it's really not a good time for me. I'll see what I can do. And they, that's what Luke says. They all alike began to make their excuses, one after the other. So the master becomes angry, and he goes and sends the slaves out and says, okay, get everyone you can invite, everyone who's going to come. And the one requirement, they have to want to be there. And so he goes and invites all, it doesn't matter who they were, he goes by the highways and the byways and just grabs whoever, and if they want to come, they can come. And then the master concludes out of anger, he says, none of those who I invited will ever taste my dinner. Meaning, God's not going to come down and force feed. Graciously he draws us, graciously he creates the desires in us, graciously he brings us to himself through his sovereignty and his grace, but he's not going to chase after someone and feed them something that they don't want. He creates the desire in us so that he can fill it. If I invited you over and we were going to have a meal, you don't have to bring anything. If I said bring a casserole or else I'm going to close the door, then if you showed up with something and you you didn't have anything, I could close the door. But if you showed up with a, I, I just said bring an appetite and you just came, that would be one thing. You know, you would just have to come and eat. And there you, you know, we'd have a good time. There, there we have it. But if you just, no, I don't really want to come. I'm not going to come after you with a ladle full of something and, and say, if you don't want it, you don't want it. That's, then you're not going to get it. But the problem is people not wanting things that they should want. Uh, and in spiritual matters, like wanting something, being hungry, you actually have to go do it. But longing after something is a grace in itself. That's God's grace. Hunger also refuses to give up. Uh, Think about fighting sin. Uh, We should stop hungering and thirsting, stop seeking after righteousness as soon as sin stops trying to gain mastery over us. But that's not going to happen. Sin will always try to expand, try to get greater, try to hold on tighter. And that's why you have to continually pursue righteousness and, and try to truly kill sin instead of coming to a comfortable truce with it. Another point, hunger involves eating with an appetite. Uh, real hunger, true hunger, not probably what we've experienced in this room, Real hunger does not involve pickiness. It doesn't involve <coughs> lack of appreciation for what's put on the plate. Uh, have you ever experienced that where you're embarrassed for the person because it's the stupidity there of not wanting to eat what grandma put in front of them or something? Mm-hmm. Not you guys, but <laughs> talking about other people. <laughs> you know what I mean. The righteousness of God is not offered to those who don't even want it. Weak desire and no desire are not the same thing. You can have a weak desire and the di- desire still exists and still be there. No desire means that the person is dead. On the positive side, as I mentioned with that example of coming to my house with a casserole, or if I just said, just come and all you need to bring is an appetite, that's all we're asked to bring to God. That's all we're asked to bring to righteousness. Isaiah 55, 1, the verse before the verse I read earlier, says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, 
And you who have no money, come, and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. The requirement of the gospel is not works or merit or goodness, but poorness, weakness, brokenness, and starvation. <laughs> Those who meet the requirements apply within. It's, it's, <laughs> it's very simple that you just need to desire it. Thomas Watson said of this passage, We are not bid to bring any merits as the papists, in other words, the Catholics, would do, nor bring any sum of money to purchase righteousness, he says, or else rich men would do that. He says, all that is required is that we bring an appetite. We're like the survivors of a shipwreck in the middle of the ocean. The only thing available is bitter, salty seawater. And all, and we're dying of thirst, and someone offers us a cup of water. We would want that. We would desire that. Because it would satisfy the thirst. But imagine this. Imagine a rebel standing or kneeling before a king who's committed treason, and justly deserves the death penalty. Imagine that. And the king wants to be gracious to him and stands over him and says, do you desire a pardon? Because if you desire to be pardoned, you will be set free. And imagine the rebel saying, no, for whatever reasons. If you don't desire it, then he'll justly be put to death. That's just how it will go. And so God's not going to extend his righteousness to people who don't even have the slightest desire for it. Uh, Jonathan Edwards commented on this passage in Isaiah, passage about come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And this is what he writes. <clears throat> how gracious he is here in inviting everyone who thirsts. And so in repeating his invitation over and over, your poverty having nothing to pay for it, shall be no objection. What gracious arguments he uses with you. As much to say, it is altogether needless for you to continue laboring and toiling for that which can never serve your turn, seeking rest in this world and your own righteousness. I have made abundant provision for you, of which is really good and will fully satisfy your desires and answer your end. And I stand ready to accept of you. You need not be afraid. If you will come to me, I will engage to see all your wants supplied, and you be made a happy creature. I Meaning God continues to argue and pull and bring people to him who ever desires. And so the only ones who are blessed, fortunate to be congratulated, or happy in the kingdom of God, are those with that desire for righteousness, and those who hunger and thirst for it. Not who can simply take it or leave it, and it's like, well, if I get righteousness, that's kind of an added benefit, but I'm not going to like go after righteousness. It, it, that, that's going to be too much of a hassle. Another point is hunger appreciates the sweetness of food, meaning hunger enjoys the food. Uh, God is not serving us gruel in the orphanage over and over again. True hunger and thirst eats with expectation of usually two things. We usually try to eat with enjoyment of the food and satisfaction, meaning you don't sit down to have a meal in order to go, okay, well, I'm going to eat this, uh, but I'm going to still be hungry. You try to eat something and you try to eat something you like. And so not only is it healthy, not only is it the right kind of food, but it's enjoyable. Real food is enjoyable and flavorful. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they get to taste and experience all the various flavors of everything God has to offer. They get to taste the various flavors of God, of Christ, of the gospel, of the gospel, of the word of God. They get to taste all the thing, all the flavors in the, each member of the Trinity. You get to taste all the offices of who Christ is. You get to taste all the work of the Spirit. You get to taste every genre of Scripture. You get to look at Christ in every name that He has. You get to look at uh, every aspect of the Gospel, that God's judgment and God's love and God's grace. You get to experience all of God's attributes and His kindness and His holiness and His sovereignty. You get to experience all His means of grace in the church. I mean, we don't just have one aspect where we go to God. We have multiple aspects that He's provided. And we get to experience all kinds of different believers in the past and in the present and all of that kind of flavor. There's a lot 
mm-hmm. of righteousness that's there. There's a a flavor for every person to enjoy whatever their need is. And it's not that you just get every need met. You get every spiritual want met. Uh, this is not that you fulfill all your wants somehow through the gospel. It's that your spiritual desires are actually fulfilled. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I mean, we're called to taste. The conflict comes in when we want to try to taste God and see, okay, what's, what's this taste like? But we still want to eat all, a bunch of other things. When God is calling us to eat spiritually of him exclusively, meaning we can't just eat our sin and enjoy that because it's poisonous to all the other things that we're eating. And another point is hunger is not just satisfied once. You don't just, okay, let me get my hunger over with. I'm going to eat. It's a one-time temporary event. And uh, now I'm not going to be hungry again. And I don't have to deal with that anymore. And I can move on to greater things. The reason why, and now think about how we're satisfied now and we're satisfied in the present. It's the same with food. The reason why we're satisfied with food is because we find it satisfying. Think about this. If you like steak or something... You eat steak, and you're satisfied, and that makes you like steak more, so you look forward to it in the future being satisfying again, and you continue to satisfy yourself. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about satisfaction now and satisfaction in the future. So your eating of something that you like, your ice cream or whatever, it increases your ability to be satisfied in that thing, meaning the more ice cream that you eat, the more ice cream you like, and you're going to be satisfied with it more and more. And that's what, uh, that's what the hunger is. Luke 6.21, in a similar uh, passage to this, Jesus said, Blessed are, the, are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. The blessing is not for people who have at one time hungered in their lives for the things of God. It is for people who are currently hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And you continue to hunger, and you continue to be filled. And the last one, hunger is a sign of life and health. Uh, One of the most obvious signs that someone is healthy after they've been sick is when they want to eat. And on the other side of that is one of the most ominous signs uh, that show that's uh, that's concerning when someone is sick is when they have no appetite, when they don't want to eat anything. Uh, All Christians at one time or another experience weaker desires and we all want stronger desires desires for the right things. But a dead man is not a hungry man. Uh, It's not the same thing. So if you have no hunger, you have no desire. If someone has no desire, it's because they're not saved. If they have weak desire, there's hope, there's grace extended to that as well. Uh, Thomas Watson wrote, though a pulse beats but weak, it shows that there's life. And weak desires should not be discouraged. There is a promise made to them. Those who struggle with sin show life. Those who experience no struggle, well, I never really struggled with sin. Well, it's because they're at peace with sin. It's because they're dead, because a dead man doesn't struggle. But settling into a comfortable truce with sin is not an option. And it's not someone who seeks or hungers after righteousness. And then the last point uh, is fairly short the promise of spiritual hunger. And the promise is is very simple, stated by Jesus, that those who hunger and thirst are not left hanging, but that they will be satisfied. Jesus still gives the blessing for those who hunger and thirst, but he also promises to satisfy it, meaning he's not withholding. He doesn't just give the hunger and hold back the thing that satisfies it. And the verses we already read tonight, but I'll read again, Isaiah 55, 2 says, Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Meaning we're not supposed to eat without being actually satisfied in what we're eating. No one really eats food that way. And this is not something that God wants us to miss and that Jesus is unclear about. God creates the desire so that he can fill it. One last verse, Psalm 37, verses 3 and 4, Trust in the Lord. And do good, dwell in the land, and cultivate faithfulness. That can also be translated, feed securely, or feed on his faithfulness. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you 
the desires of your heart. So to sacrifice other food, other types of spiritual food that we may try to fill ourselves with, for spiritual food actually holds out the promise of true satisfaction, meaning God actually creates the need and satisfies it at the same time. And Jesus promises a free and full satisfaction in both of those things. So let's pray, and then uh, we'll go to our small groups. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to focus on who you are and focus on your word. And we pray, Lord, that you will increase our hunger for you uh, and that we will seek you uh, more earnestly, Lord, that we'll think about where uh, in our lives we're not hungering for you and thirsting for you as we should be, and that you will uh, help us to repent of those things and to change our hearts uh, Lord, so that we can follow you. We pray again for this night, and we pray that uh, the rest of what we say will be edifying to one another and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.